I've noticed some interesting things that Taylor Swift is doing with her career that I thought would be kind of fun to talk about and kind of important to take a look at and see how it relates to us as indie artists or as indie record labels. Now, I'm not a fan of Taylor Swift, but I'm not not a fan of Taylor Swift, but I'm a huge fan of what she's doing right now in the music industry, specifically with her back catalog. Now, what's a back catalog? Well, the music industry defines a back catalog as anything that's over 18 months old. So any release that's over a year and a half old. And why this is so interesting is at the time of recording this, she released a new record like less than a year ago, maybe eight months ago. But the narrative and the things that they're promoting are not necessarily anything to do with that record. So that's why I think it's really interesting. And there's three things that I've noticed happening right now. So if you're watching this in the future, it might not be as relevant, but I still think that the lessons that we can learn from her for how we treat our own back catalog and our previous releases and how we put less emphasis on our current release and take the pressure off of promoting our current release, whatever new single we just released or new album release, these lessons I think will apply forever in the music industry. I've just noticed some things that Taylor's been doing in the industry and I wanted to talk about them with you and share some of the lessons I think that we can pull from it. I have a 12-year-old daughter. I know that's hard to believe. I don't look a day older than 15 myself. Thanks so much. Your words, not mine. But she was showing me all these Taylor Swift songs that she's been listening to. And I wanted to kind of tell her, I'm like, hey, do you know the background of these Taylor version reissues? Let me tell you. And she's like, I don't care. So I'll tell you instead. By the way, welcome to other record labels. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I'm Scott. I have some resources if you're interested. If you're an independent artist, I have a toolbox, which is some lessons and resources and checklists and stuff that you can take from independent record labels and apply to yourself if you are a DIY artist who run your own career. On the other hand, if you're an independent record label or somebody thinking about starting an independent record label, you can download my toolkit. So if you're a record label, go to otherrecordlabels.com slash toolkit. If you're an independent artist, go to otherrecordlabels.com slash toolbox. Toolbox? Toolkit. Here are three music strategies I think we can take from Taylor Swift, specifically when it relates to our back catalog, our older releases. Let's talk about the first thing, and it's talk about her reissues that she's been doing now for a couple of years. So basically, the story with these Taylor's version albums is that somebody else owns the master recording rights to her first few albums. I don't know how many albums, all the way up to maybe like uh, Reputation or Lover or something, like not including Lover before she signed her own deal. So, so the recordings, not necessarily the publishing, but although perhaps some of that as well, but definitely the recordings are owned by somebody else and they've been sold around. I think she had an opportunity or she wanted to buy them and she didn't have an opportunity regardless. Instead of moaning about it, she did something that not a lot of people have ever done before and certainly not at her level, which is just re-record them, which is insane. I don't think anybody really foresaw what that would mean. I think I originally thought, okay, well, it's not going to sound like the originals. Fans aren't going to be fooled and they'll probably just still listen to the originals. Well, the complete opposite has happened. It's one of the greatest middle fingers to the music industry I've ever seen. But what lessons can we take from this? She didn't just re-record these albums and then just put them up on Spotify without any fanfare. Quite the opposite. There's massive fanfare around these albums that are really old. Now, just a little caveat here. I know that a lot of you are thinking, what lessons can we take from the biggest superstar in the world? We don't have the same fan base. People don't get excited or the press doesn't write about who we're dating or what our lyrics are about. I understand that. I understand that. Let's do our best to take these lessons and apply them even on our small micro level compared to Taylor's big macro level. But when she does these Taylor version releases, which I think happen every one or two years, again, I'm not a, a Taylor expert, so I'm just kind of pulling what I'm noticing here. But when she does these big releases every one or two years, they're massive spectacles. The artwork is incredible. They're released on multiple color vinyl. They get new music videos. They're padded with bonus tracks and unreleased tunes. Now, reissues aren't a new thing. Reissues have been happening all the time. At 10 years, 25 years, 50 years, one year. People will release a deluxe edition one year later and add some bonus tracks. So that's not new. But I think what is really imp impressive about Taylor Swift is how she is taking these releases so seriously. They get details leaked and it's a special release day. And the album goes to number one. I mean, these old albums that people have already heard, they go to number one. She's breathing new life into these releases. I think this is like the biggest reinvention of a reissue, which seems like kind of like a redundant thing here. I think 
the lesson that I can pull from these reissues is there was this quote recently. I don't, I can't, I don't know the exact quote, but there's someone talking recently about how this concept of like, if you make something feel really important, if you take something super serious, then the general public will kind of feel like they have to take it seriously as well. Like if you make something seem really important, other people will naturally view it as important too. And I think that's what's happening with these reissues. She's just taking these old albums and she's adding this narrative that it's hers and she's being set free by the music industry and and she's reclaiming what was hers There's, and she's putting an emphasis on all these old songs and the historical part of her career. These are all just incredible narratives that are working really well. And so she's making these reissues really important and the rest of us are believing that they're really important and it's working. They're selling and they're going to number one. So your takeaway, and even though you're not a massive superstar like Taylor, but your takeaway is to treat your back catalog with some respect and to put time and effort in bringing that back catalog back to the forefront, to do creative things with your old albums, not to think of your career as linear, but to think of it as more of a circle where we can always revisit songs that have been written written and released a long time ago and add some value and significance and importance to your back catalog every couple of years in the same way that Taylor's doing. Lesson number two. So I don't know too many details about this, but I know that at the time of recording this, she's released a single from an album that's like four years old and the song is Cruel Summer. And it's a summer single that they're releasing right now. It's something the fans I think had wanted her to do. It's kind of promoting her tour a little bit. But I think it's so bizarre in any record label that would have control over an artist, which I don't think people do for Taylor anymore, but they would say, you can't do this. You just released a new album eight months ago. We have to continue to promote that record. You can't release a single that was never released as a single from an album that's four or five years old. That's absurd. It totally is absurd. But what makes it important for this video and for us as independent record labels or independent artists, the lesson is break the rules and stop doing things that are so traditional and quite frankly, boring. We've talked about this on this channel so much, just about the idea that we don't need to follow this old format for independent record labels. Or if you're an independent artist, you don't need to follow the format of major label artists, even though that's what this whole video is about. But Taylor's breaking the rules. And the traditional rule is to have two or three lead up singles for an album, maybe release another single from the album. This applies less to us because we don't do radio stuff, but this was the tradition forever. And us as independent record labels, all we know to do is just to kind of follow the model from the mainstream that seems to be working so that we can kind of fall in line and hopefully ride the coattails of their success. But this lesson of releasing a single years after an album when there's been two to three or four albums, I have no idea, in between this release is insane. And it tells us we should be breaking the rules. We should be doing things our own way. And my gosh, it might just work. Maybe it doesn't work, but who cares? It's way more fun than just following other people's rules. And finally, let's talk about the third thing I've been noticing with Taylor Swift, and that's the Eras Tour, this, this massive tour that she's on right now. And like I mentioned, she just released a record a couple months ago. So why isn't this tour a reflection of that album or just promoting that album? Instead, she's breaking up the concert into these little sections that celebrate a different album. I think the big lesson that we can take from this video and from all of these things, but especially this era's tour, is that a lot of artists will treat their releases like layers of skin, skin that they shed away. That's kind of gross, but it's true. A lot of creatives don't want to be associated with their earlier work, and they're more interested in their current work, which is fine. I get it. That's true. But look at this era's tour. Even some of the older stuff, some of the stuff that she maybe even thinks is kind of cringy, She's celebrating it and realizing, hey, this was me. This is like an old photograph. We can look back and laugh or we can look back and be sentimental. But this is just a really fascinating way to look at your back catalog. So many artists are like this. I'm done with that. Let's just leave it up on streaming, not draw attention to it. But instead, she's drawing attention to it. This is a huge lesson that I think that we can learn about the importance of treating our back catalog as some sort of series of books where each album is like a book in like the Harry Potter series or a season of a TV show. Maybe there are seasons that aren't as great as the current one. Maybe the first one is the best or the third one is the best, but it's important that they all 
fit together. I don't think any of us should treat our back catalog as mile markers that we leave behind, that we're getting further and further from. And that's something that a lot of artists do, and that's something that Taylor could have done, is leaving some of these albums 10 to 15 to 20 years in the past. Instead, she's celebrating them. So what does that look like for us? I don't know, be creative. Maybe if you're promoting older, older releases, you can do it with a little bit of tongue in cheek. You can do it in saying, wow, this is a little bit, you know, my voice wasn't as evolved back then. My lyrics were a little rough, but talk about it and share it. And those albums will still be meaningful to some people. So don't discredit the memories and the connections they have with some of your older work. Do not delete your music as you evolve as a band or an artist. Don't, if you're a record label, don't let your artist delete music from streaming or from Bandcamp just because they're not proud of it anymore. Okay. Two big lessons from all of this. Number one, break the rules. Stop doing what you think you should be doing as an independent artist or what you think you should be doing as an independent record label. And number two, take your back catalog seriously, treat it with respect, and revisit it regularly. Back catalogs are playing a much larger role, and that's why we're seeing them being purchased for mega millions of dollars in this new streaming landscape, as well as in the landscape of people buying deluxe versions on vinyl, passing those vinyl on to the future generations and revisiting it over and over, a record that they grew up with as a teenager or a record that they listened to when they first were dating their spouse. Back catalogs are playing a bigger, bigger, bigger role as we're realizing that people are connected to this history of music. If you're an artist, don't get too cool for your back catalog and for your old releases. Don't be ashamed of them. If you're a record label, encourage your artists to revisit their back catalog, to do so in creative ways, and to treat their releases as critical chapters in the story of their career. If you're an artist and you want some record label style resources to run your own music career, go to otherrecordlabels.com slash toolbox, where I've got some super helpful resources for you there. If you're a record label or thinking about starting a record label, go to otherrecordlabels.com slash toolkit, where I've got a ton of resources to help you start your own record label, even if you're just an independent artist who wants to release your own music on your own record label. Go to otherrecordlabels.com slash toolkit.